the strengths, I think, of the film is sort of the authenticity of the characters, particularly dialogue. It's not too clever. It's not too quirky. It's mm -hmm. not trying to be too smart. It's how people talk, how teenagers talk. Um, and as a result, it's sort of, uh, I know you've talked a, a little bit, sort of the John Hughes uh, pedigree that goes into it, this timeless yeah. aspect that these characters can sort of be dropped in at any point in time, and you get the feel for them. Was that one of the sort of, I guess, the, the, the key things that you picked up on in sort of exploring your character uh, when he first got the script, sort of how these characters lived? Absolutely. Uh, I've read scripts of contemporary pieces before and never really ever connected like I did with this one. And I think that until I made it, I realized that so much of what I connected to was the, the, the language, the dialogue, and the real life aspects of walking through the hallways of a high school and feeling like this is what it sounds like, this is what it feels like, and here I am at my locker, I'm gonna try and act busy even though I have nowhere to be for like eight minutes and I have no one to talk to. Um, but those little moments, there were so many of those that are, are real and I feel like regardless of whether or not you were in high school or not, I was homeschooled so I didn't have that traditional high school experience but I had those real life moments and this film captures it so well and again the, the the dialogue was one thing that from the very beginning our director Kelly uh, had said if, if any if at any point any of this doesn't feel real or natural please say what you would say and to have that freedom is one thing but to um, I mean not have to do it in the first place was is another so I mean, because you're in sort of that that age range where I would imagine you see projects sim in this sort of similar range at times is that I mean does this film then sort of stand out for you because there's nothing about this film that would say like hey, this took place in 2016, you know, like the lingo sure. or terminology or anything where in a few years you might look at it and say, nah, it feels sort of dated. Um, was, can you sort of, I guess, compare it to other projects that you may have looked at that don't necessarily have that real texture to it? Yeah, I don't know that I could compare it to anything really. Um, I think that's why it's so special. <laughs> uh, but I think you know, forms of, of communication change and with this movie it, it so perfectly sort of nails that on the head with social media and how it, you know, generally affects our lives without making it the center of the film, whereas we can look at it a couple years from now and think, wow, like that's, that was representing that specific time. Um, it's become so uh, prominent in our world and in my generation that it's just part of life. Um, and I think that we, we kind of mastered that in this film without, again, making it sort of the center of attention. One of the things with sort of Nadine is she is she's trying to find something um, throughout the entire film, whether it's friendship or love or acceptance or mm. self-esteem. What did you find, I guess, to be sort of the most difficult element for her to try and get a grasp on? Because she is very much lost, but what did you find, I guess, that in your exploration of the character she had a tough time with? finding a connection because she would find a conversation and she would find you know what she th would think love was supposed to feel like but she would never have that real human connection um, until you know until she does that's constantly what she's searching for and she thinks that it's so many other things a conversation a friend a guy friend a phone call a text message a Facebook message a response from somebody um, and it's it's not in any of the places she's looking until she kind of realizes that you know not only has it been there all along but she just has this sort of underlying inner strength that she ends up discovering that wasn't necessarily there for her all along. So um, I think her finding that within herself and just finding that connection, that real honest connection with people. Um, watching this film, it was interesting for me because uh, I was once a teenager. Um, I'm mm -hmm. older now, mm -hmm. um, but I remember watching sort of like the Ferris Bueller's and the Breakfast Clubs and identifying with those films as a teenager. Now as an adult, I identify with it in a, in a totally different way. I think Two of the characters that uh, I wanted you to sort of get your read on are Kira Sedgwick as your mom, mm -hmm. as well as Woody Harrelson as this sort of wise, smart-ass uh, teacher. Mm -hmm. These are two people that have clearly been teenagers before. Um, they've, they've seen it all. They've been through similar things. Uh, why is it, that, in your opinion, that the, the young people don't sort of listen to <laughs> the perspective of the older people who have been through been it there. before and, and can 
Because the thing about you know films like this is they, they transcend time. We've all been teenagers, similar experiences, but the wisdom that could be passed on could, could sort of say like, hey, everything is gonna be okay right. once you get past it. Right, you know, I mean, I'm 19, I'm still trying to figure out why I don't. Don't listen. <laughs> I'll ask my mom for advice, she'll tell me and I will not listen. Um, I think it's the idea that, you know, they, they're telling us what we, what we need to hear and not what we want to hear. And there's always that sort of reality of, please just, just tell me something. And, and when you're that desperate and you know what, it's, what the answer's gonna be, like, I guess for me, like, there are certain people I know I'm not gonna go to because they're gonna tell me the, the honest truth and I'm not gonna <laughs> go to them because I don't want to hear it. I guess it's just a matter of like, Figuring, figuring certain things out for yourself. There's also, I, I think there's a really interesting thing in the film sort of with Brody Jenner as your brother, this very distinct compare and contrast between the personalities. There's one moment, it's really subtle, that I thought was, was brilliant, which is sort of this intercutting between just the drinks that they have. Mm. He has sort of this perfect smoothie blender sure. concoction, uh. and you have like a triple decker multi-flavored yep. smoothie. Um, <laughs> how much input, I guess, did you sort of have into uh, what your character looked like, how she felt, um, in, to sort of really have a complete juxtaposition against sort of this goofy but really sort of flawless right. uh, dude who's right. supposed to be like the most pristine character yeah. uh, in it? Well, a lot of those decisions were made sort of, you know, in the moment. I mean, we were at like a, a 7-Eleven type play. I think, was it actually a 7-Eleven? Maybe? Yes, I think, um, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, and I was there and we had set the camera up for one one color or two colors, right? And I was like, well, there's four of them here. There's three of them here. I'd go all the way down the line and they'd bring the camera back a little further. Um, but things like that and, and the wardrobe, finding the wardrobe for this character, finding, you know, something that was quirky and interesting and different and obviously she's called out on screen for not having the best style but um making it still sort of aspirational in a way um but going the extra mile and like making the conscious decision that i'm going to put shoes with dogs on them and wear cat socks was that, a, was that a dude sweatshirt that is a dude that sweatshirt. is a dude sweatshirt that right the, the abide yeah that's, oh that is it's pretty fire <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much thank you